Hi, this is Dr. Justin Estery. This is week four of PolySci 509, The Linear Model. And today what we're going to talk about is what properties we can derive from or we can infer about uh, ordinary least squares regression when we presume that OLS is an accurate reflection of the data generating process, whatever that may be. Uh, what, am I, what am I referring to here? Well, up until this point, everything we've talked about um, OLS, everything we said about OLS, all the properties were derived about OLS, are, have been fairly agnostic about whether OLS is an actually good or accurate reflection of the data generating process, which is to say that uh, all the properties you've talked about hold regardless of the underlying data generating process, which is a very powerful thing because it means that everything we've said is useful even if we know OLS is kind of wrong, but we're using it as an approximation to that underlying DGP. Uh, to give you a couple of examples of things that are true, um, even when OLS is, is not a reflection uh, of the underlying data generating process, uh, we know that OLS will fit a line that minimizes the sum of est uh, squared estimated errors u transpose u or u hat transpose u hat, which is uh, just a technical way of saying that uh, ordinary least squares regression will put a line that fits the data minimi uh, that minimizes the degree of estimated error, uh, um, no matter what the underlying data generating process is. Now, they, those errors could be big. The fitted line could do abuse to our understanding of the data generating process. It's, it's all true. Nevertheless, um, it'll be the best we can do with a straight line or a plane or hyperplane. Uh, number two, and, and sort of another way of saying what I said before, um, x beta hat from an ordinary squares regression provides the best linear error maximum minimi best linear error minimizing approximation to the expected value of y given x. So the data generating process is some way of some function that maps x into y with an expectation, right? So if, if we have any particular value y0, um, the DGP has some noise in it, but it also has a signal, and the signal component is what would we expect to see for that uh, data set given an x value. This data generating expectation, the expectation of the data generating process may well not be linear. It's probably very often not going to be linear. OLS will give us the best linear approximation to that process. Um, sometimes this is stated as OLS is the um, best linear approximation to the conditional mean. So even when it's wrong, uh, OLS is right, sort of, in a sense. But now we're going to go further. Now we're going to say, suppose OLS is right. And what I mean by that is, uh, suppose that the world is a linear model, the data generating process is a linear model, y equals x beta plus u. Maybe we don't know exactly what x beta should be, um, but we know it's something and we know that it, it's linear. In fact, it's, it's a, it is a, the world is, in some sense, a linear model. If that's true, or it's mostly true, close to true, I should say, then OLS has some very attractive properties when applied to data generated out of that process. So here's how we're going to proceed today. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of properties that are, are true of OLS in this world where the, da the data generating process is linear. And uh, the way we're going to demonstrate each of those properties is we're going to make some assumptions about the world. Um, and our res our, uh, there's, these assumptions are unproven. They're taken, they're, they're taken on at face value. Uh, the results that we'll get are a combination of these assumptions and of the logical rules of mathematics. Um, and these assumptions effectively codify our statement that we are going to presume as though the world is some kind of linear data generating process and operate accordingly. And if we're right, all sorts of wonderful things will happen, and those wonderful things are the things I'm about to unfold. Uh, five of the assumptions are thought to be uh, the most important um, because they are the minimal set of assumptions from which the best known results flow, which is just to say there are certain properties of OLS that often get cited and uh, are thought to be especially important, and those properties uh, derive from five assumptions that uh, compose the classical linear regression model. 
So let's talk a little bit about what those five assumptions are and start proving results uh, with those assumptions. All right, so here, uh, here are the uh, classical linear regression assumptions. Uh, the classical linear regression model is uh, defined by these uh, five assumptions. Uh, the first one is, is uh, kind of the one that we've already stated, which is uh, right here. Um, y equals x beta plus u. This assumption is uh, actually a, can be thought of as three, a combination of three sub-assumptions or, or, or minor assumptions. Uh, the first of these is that we have the correct specification of x. So for many of these results to hold, it's going to be, we're going to need, not only need to know that the world is linear, in other words, that it follows this relationship, but we need to know the components that go into that relationship. Um, if we don't know some of the components of the relationship, if we omit some aspects of x or we um, put in just a linear x when we really should have x and x squared or the logarithm of x or something, we're, we might make a mistake. We might do something wrong. And, and, um, and, and what I mean by that is some of these properties that we're about to uh, unfold may not hold. Uh, secondly, it implies that the world is linear. So it's not just we know what covariates uh, influence y. We also know that they influence y in a certain way and that we can uh, write that way down. Now, by linear, I mean it can just be written in the form of a linear equation. So this is also, and now I'm going to use the non-matrix form just to, to illustrate this. Um, this is also a linear specification of x, even though it has a x squared to, or a linear relationship for, between y and x, even though it has an x squared term in here. Um, the point is we can write this specification as a linear polynomial. So that's a linear specification too. Uh, one way of thinking of this specification issue is we need to be able to write down a polynomial like this that can uh, accurately represent the relationship between y and x. Uh, and the th uh, final aspect here, or the final sub-assumption, is that there are, um, in principle, no or fixed and constant beta values. Now, that doesn't mean that our estimates of beta, beta hat, are going to be fixed and constant. In fact, there are going to be variable, and we're going to quantify that variability a little later in this lecture. But the actual data generating process, the true world, we're going to assume for the purposes of this uh, demonstration, the true world has fixed betas, and if we had the right kind of information, they could be uh, determined. They exist. So that's assumption one. Assumption two is that the expected value of the error term equals zero. Now you can see I've made a note over here that this property and the next one I'm about to talk about are properties of u, not of u hat. So uh, in a previous lecture, I told you that it was going to be true that the average value for u hat was going to equal zero no matter what the underlying DGP. And that's right, because this is a property of the ordinary least squares estimator, not of the world. This is a property that we are assuming about the world. So not only is it the case that the world is linear and composed of a combination of a linear function of x and an error term u, uh, but furthermore, we're assuming that the average value of that error is zero, which is just a kind of a way of saying that it really is error, not signal. It has no mean influence on the dependent variable. It just uh, causes deviation from the constant expectation of y that's a function of x. Uh, related assumptions are, are these assumptions in, in part three here. First, uh, we're going to assume that the expected product of ui, uj uh, or the covariance of ui, uj equals zero. And this is true for um, i and j uh, being any two observations in the, uh, in the data set or in the world. So if I choose any two observations at random, um, the covariance between their error terms should be zero. They, in other words, they should have an expected product of zero. Um, the second sub-assumption here is that the expected value of u sub i squared 
should be sigma squared or of the variance of ui. Um, this is uh, sometimes called the homoskedasticity assumption. Homo skedasticity. There's a word you can use to impress your friends. Uh, homoskedasticity just means that um, the variance of the error term is constant across observations. Variance of the error term is constant across observations. So combined, these two assumptions tell us something about the error term. In particular, they're trying to state in a formal way that u is an error term. It's error. It's not correlated with anything else. In particular, it's not correlated here with uh, other values of the error. Uh, and secondly, it's uh, got a constant variance. The variance doesn't blow up and go down all over the place. It's just a sort of white noise term where the level of noise is constant. Uh, fourth, we're going to assume that x, the set of independent variables that we're working with, is non-stochastic or fixed. Um, what that means is that we're going to treat the data set as though it was the only possible realization of the independent variable world. In other words, there was no sampling process going on in the independent variable. Um, and I'm just going to leave that as it is for a second. I'll, I'll, I'll return in a moment to it. And then finally, uh, we're going to assume that the rank of the X matrix, which is has order n by k, has a rank k, which is to say that um, uh, there's no perfect collinearity among the independent variables. That's one way of putting this assumption. Another way of putting this assumption uh, is that um, the columns of x, so all the variables, I should uh, specify this is all independent variables, give myself some more space here are uh, linearly independent from each other. So we shouldn't be able to take any combination of elements of the X matrix and combine them in linear fashion and get another element of the X matrix. And I, we've mentioned this before, but the most common way of doing this wrong is to fall into what's sometimes referred to as the dummy variable trap. So let me give you an example of the dummy variable trap. Uh, suppose you've got in your data set three regions. You've got region 1 and region 2 and region 3. And what you want to do is put in a dummy variable for each region. So we're going to put in a variable x that equals 1 when region, we're in region 1 and 0 otherwise. We're going to put in a variable uh, z, which equals 1 for region 2 and 0 otherwise. And a variable w, which equals 1 for region 3 and 0 otherwise. If we go into R, and we try to, suppose we have some dependent variable y, so that we're going to say the dv is y. And we try to write down the model y is a linear model of x, z, and w, x plus z plus w, um, plus uh, a constant term. So the constant is assumed in any, in any r model like this one. Um, this model is going to crash. And the reason it's going to crash is that x plus z plus w adds up to the constant vector, or 1. So if you um, come, in down, come down here and you think about writing out this data set, so I've got x, z, w, and then the constant. Um, you know, there are some observations for region 1 and then some that aren't. And then there are some observations for region 2, let's say these two, and others that aren't. And then there are some observations for region 3, that'll be the rest of these down here. And then the constant 
is the same, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, for all of the observations, well, I can take x plus z plus w and get the constant, and that is not so good. Um, we have violated this assumption if we do that. Uh, not only that, but as we showed a couple of weeks ago, OLS estimates cannot even be obtained in this case um, because it, uh, you have uh, more vectors in observation space than can be supported in that space. It's not a proper subspace of the space to reference some earlier terminology. Uh, now, so we've got these five assumptions. Um, and what we're going to do in the, in the next uh, bit is we're going to use these assumptions as tools to demonstrate certain properties of regression, of OLS regression. Um, we won't need all of the assumptions for every property. So not all properties depend upon all the assumptions. And that's good or interesting because what it means is that not all of these assumptions need to be met for us to be able to say some things about ordinary least squares regression. And uh, that means that sometimes we need to be more worried about the fragility of some of these results than others of them. Um, some of the results are less dependent on a large set of assumptions and therefore are more robust to the kind of peculiarities we might see in a, a, a live data set. Furthermore, um, some properties uh, can be sustained even under a relaxation of some of these assumptions. So what I mean by this is that sometimes we can find a way to say, well, you know, this proof relies on assumptions 1, 2, and 4, but what if assumption 4 wasn't true? What if we relax that a little bit? We might still be able to get that property out of the model if maybe we make a slightly different, weaker assumption. Um, so you know, there, there's some flexibility in, in when these things can be true. And then eventually, in the next couple of weeks, what we're going to find out is that um, OLS may have different properties different and known properties uh, under violations of these assumptions. And so eventually we're going to be able to assess the consequences of violating these assumptions um, by saying, well, what if this assumption isn't true? What can we expect to see from our model? And in, in some lucky events, we may even be able to fix the problems by doing something that patches the data up and makes the assumption more true. Uh, that's probably most prominently true for um, assumption number two and three, problems with the error term. There are lots of cases where there's some undesirable property of the error term in a data set or where we at least suspect that it's likely. So these assumptions aren't true and we can't appeal to them, but we'll know what's going to happen when they turn out not to be true, and maybe we can even patch things up so that the thing that happens is not all that worrisome uh, for um, inference. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So uh, let's first talk about some things we can prove in the happy event that all these things are true. Okay, we're going to start with um, perhaps the best known property of OLS, at least best known from the perspective of those who have taken um, graduate uh, statistics and econometrics courses, uh, that beta hat produced out of our famous formula, uh, just to reiterate that formula, x transpose x inverse, x transpose y equals beta hat. Uh, the beta hat produced by that formula is an unbiased estimate of beta, that is to say, the expected value of beta hat equals beta. This is kind of the baseline assumption that many um, students of OLS know that are able to prove. I'd like you to be able to um, remember and be able to recapitulate this proof um, when you need to do so on an exam or something. 
Um, and it's a very simple proof as long as we're willing to rely on the assumptions that we made in the uh, previous thing, in the previous slide. So um, let's uh, talk about what the proof of this uh, theorem looks like. So I'm going to start with beta hat equals x transpose x inverse x transpose y. I notice I wrote and I transpose that there, it should be inverse. Uh, okay, uh, now let's calculate the expectation of beta. Uh, the expectation of beta is just uh, the average, um, and expectations obey certain rules, um, which will become apparent as we start to use them here. Um, the first rule they obey is that if any variable is non-random, then we can assume immediately that its expectation is equal to itself, and that the expectation of it and any pro the product of it and any random variable is equal to that fixed variable times the product of a random variable. So let me just write down real quickly what I mean by this. Um, if I'm going to take the average or expectation of uh, a x where a is fixed and x is random, I can immediately simplify this to be, whoops, I need to write the x first, uh, or the a first, a e x. And this actually derives from um, the definition of an expectation. So uh, the definition of an expectation a definition is similar to the definition of an average. For a continuous x, what we would do to take an expectation is take the, deriv or the integral from negative infinity to infinity of a to the x dx. Oh, I'm sorry. forgot a very important part. Uh, a to the x f of x dx, uh, where f of x is the probability distribution or density function of x. So in other words, this is a probability weighted average of uh, x, ax. Uh, well, now you'll notice that what's going on here is that the only thing that's being integrated is x and f of x. a is floating around here on the outside. And it's a property of integrals to be able to say that this equals a integral x f of x dx. And so this statement, this whole thing, is equal to this. So now, simultaneously, we, or, or as a consequence, we can say that uh, this, which is this, is equal to this, which equals this. So that's a little bit of, of math background and, and um, working with expectations for you to get a sense of um, what's going on here. This expectation operator is a lot easier to write uh, than to write out this integral for, for calculating expectations of continuous variables all the time. So we're going to make frequent use of E whenever we need to take expectations, that is to say, uh, weighted averages. So let me, uh, actually, hold on. So I'm actually going to uh, take this stuff And I'm going to uh, move this down here into a new section called Properties of Expectations, just so you have it for your own reference if you need it. So I'll take this down here into uh, Properties of Expectations. I'll just throw that right there so that you always have it if you need it. Perfect. All right. Now, getting back to the uh, proof at hand. So uh, this quantity, I'm going to say this here is all fixed, and only this part is random. And I can invoke assumption number four to do so. So this is a move I'm making as a consequence of, uh, actually, I'm not going to write assumption now every time, of uh, A4, assumption four is enabling me to do this step here, which is x, I wrote a little wrong there, uh, x transpose x inverse, x transpose the expectation of y. So that 
that move I just made, I made as a uh, as a uh, consequence of assumption four. Uh, now the next thing I'm going to do is uh, substitute in what y is. Now from assumption one, going back up to my assumptions here, I know that y equals x beta plus u. So I can make use of that assumption in saying that this equals x transpose x inverse, x transpose the expectation of x beta plus u. That is true as a consequence of assumption one. So far, so good. Uh, now, I'm going to need to move this down a little bit. OK. Uh, now what I'm going to do is say, all right, I've got uh, two assumption or two uh, quantities that I'm adding together here. It turns out, and I can go, come down here to my properties of assumptions, uh, that um, go down. If E x plus y, where x and y are both random, Uh, is equal to e to the x plus e to the y or e of the y and e a plus x where a is fixed and x is random equals a plus e to the x. And actually, it might be helpful um, for me to kind of uh, write uh, there equals and then put this up here so you know that's equal. I'll put that up there. All right. No, no. <laughs> Move this over here. Move that right there. There we go. So in my case, the relevant uh, thing is going to be this one. That relevant property is going to be that one. Uh, and I know that because both aspects here are fixed. X is fixed and beta is fixed. Beta is fixed as a consequence of assumption 1. We have constant beta values that are the true values. Maybe we don't know them, but they're there. Uh, u, on the other hand, uh, is going to be considered a random variable as uh, as a feature of the fact that it's an error term and therefore it's it's noisy. It is noise. It, it uh, captures designed to capture noise. Uh, so by the properties of expectation, I'm going to be able to write x transpose x inverse x transpose x beta plus uh, x transpose x inverse x transpose u. So all I've done is taken, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the expectation here. I need to put in that expectation right there. Expectation of u. So all I've done here is uh, taken e to the x beta plus u equals x beta plus e to the u. And then I've taken this bit right here, this uh, matrix pre-multiplication and distributed it among the terms as is consistent with matrix algebra. So this is this is what I get. Uh, and this is actually pretty cool because I'm pretty close to having a result now. So uh, first thing I can do is say that a matrix times its inverse equals 1. So um, I'm going to be able to just kill that right there and just get beta. Uh, the next thing I'm going to be able to do is say, well, the expectation of u according to assumption 2 is equal to 0. The expected value of the error term is equal to 0. It's an error term. So by making use of assumption 2, I can now say this is just beta. The expected value of beta hat equals beta. Proof complete. So there you go. Uh, by making use of a couple of assumptions, we were able to demonstrate that OLS estimates are expected to be um, an accurate representation of the true beta. And remember that expectation, as we discussed here, is uh, what amounts to an average or some kind of weighted average. So what this is telling you is that on average, 
uh, in repeated samples, for example, if you're uh, thinking about this uh, in a frequentist framework, in repeated samples, we would expect um, running OLS on each one of those new samples of data we're taking every time, we would expect on average the beta hat to equal beta. That doesn't necessarily mean that any particular beta that we get, beta hat that we get, is equal to the true beta in that data set. Not true at all. Uh, what we say is that this method is one that if we um, did it over and over again, on average we would get the right answer. So you can think a little bit of uh, this. You can think of this as a little bit like uh, shooting a gun at a target. So now I'm going to uh, um, inflict a terrible drawing upon you. So um, suppose that I've got um, a target, right? So I'm shooting at a target uh, with <laughs> concentric circles, as concentric as I can get them. Um, here we go. And uh, right in the middle, the target is the true beta. That's what we're shooting at. Is that true beta? Now, any particular um, estimate of beta, so like this right here, might not be the right beta. But if we were to take a new sample of data out of the same data generating process and estimate a new beta hat, we might get something else. And we might get something else if we did that again, and if we did it again, and we did it again, and we did it all over and over and over again. And if we did it over and over again, what we should see is that although there's variation in exactly how accurate it is, on average, our beta hat estimates that come out of each one of those samples from the data generating process, on average, are hitting the target. Now, a question that immediately follows from this is, well, how spread out will be the distributions of shots at that target? You know, it's much better to have an estimator that has a very tight distribution than a spread out crazy one. That's true. And in fact, uh, in a couple of slides, we're going to get to a point where we're talking about that. Uh, one more thing I wanted to note about this proof before we move on. I wrote next to uh, the lines of the proof each assumption that we used as a part of this process. We used assumptions 4, 1, and 2. So in order to make this uh, proof work, we had to assume, oh, that was too far. Uh, we had to assume first that the model was linear and that the betas were constant. Uh, we had to assume that the expected value of the error term was equal to zero, and we had to assume that x was non-stochastic or fixed. We did not have to assume anything about the rank of x, although we know that OLS won't even run if we don't have that. And most significantly, we didn't have to assume these rather restrictive conditions on errors not be cor being correlated with each other and having constant uh, variance. That we didn't need that for this. So, uh, one thing this tells you, among others is that um, this property holds when u is heteroscedastic, which is to say does not have constant variance. And the reason I'm making this a point is that there are lots of people who um, have gone through an uh, OLS course or some other econometrics course and who memorize these assumptions and then are always on the lookout for, hey, I need to make sure that my five assumptions hold or else, you know, or else, or else something. Um, and what they usually conclude is, or else my model is completely useless, right? My model is bad. Um, well, it, it's, it, it's going to have some, some challenges, but exactly how the model is deficient is going to depend on which assumptions are wrong and how those assumptions link through to the properties of OLS. So in the case, for example, where we have non-constant error variance, which is to say heteroscedasticity, which we're going to talk about later, um, we would still expect our OLS estimates of beta hat to be unbiased. What I'm telling you is that it's very important to understand the peculiarities or the, speci the specific natures, nature of how assumptions link through to results because that's going to enable you to uh, diagnose uh, regression specification problems and then make sense of how, uh, how bad the consequences of those problems are going to be. Um, you don't want to be in a position of underestimating or overestimating uh, the deficiencies in your results, and uh, you know you want to have an understanding of how you can use those um, um, responsibly. 
And, and this, uh, this kind of demonstration hopefully will enable you to make that assessment. There are going to be some happy times when uh, we don't need um, all of the assumptions uh, to prove some kind of uh, result. And you saw last time we didn't need all five assumptions to prove a result. And in fact, we don't even need all four of the assumptions we used to prove the result that uh, beta hat is an unbiased estimate of, of beta. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, suppose that we make a slightly different assumption. Uh, I'm going to start right here. So all the proof that I did up to this point right there is going to be the same as last time. So let me get all this stuff in here. I drag this up here. Uh, everything about the proof is going to be the same up to this point except when I get to here. So x transpose x, x inverse, x transpose times the quantity, the expected value of x beta plus u. And instead of writing what I wrote last time, uh, using the assumption that the expectation of the error term is 0, uh, I'm going to write x transpose x inverse x transpose times x beta plus x transpose x inverse x transpose u. So I didn't invoke the assumption that the expected value of u is 0. Rather, um, I, uh, oh, actually, I need to put an expectation in here. Move that over. I need to say that the expected value of this quantity goes here. So I'm not going to just quickly go to the part, point where um, I can just say all these x's are fixed and the expectation of u is 0. Uh, I am going to, in other words, suppose that x is non-fixed and non-stochastic. What that means is that I can't make the move I made last time of just writing 0 because I'm not able to move the expectation in past all these x's into the u. I've got to deal with the fact that these two things are now inextricably bound together and random. So their expectation might be something crazy. Well, what I'm going to do is say, and you can sort of see I've written it already down here, uh, instead of assuming that the x's are non-stochastic, I'm going to say, uh, no, the x's are random. And maybe that's a more realistic view on the world. It's not the case that the independent variables exist, don't come out of some causal process of their own that has some kind of error term associated with it. Uh, if, we re, if we re ran history, we would get different values of the independent variables because history would, the little peculiar, noisy parts of history would be a little different, and those would create slightly different um, worlds, different x's. Um, so x's are random, that's more realistic. Instead, what I'm going to assume is that x is not correlated with u. This is a way of saying x is not correlated with u. Now, uh, how do I know that this crazy expected value function that I wrote down is equivalent to saying x is not correlated with u? Well, remember our formula for beta hat. Beta hat equals x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So anything you put in for y right here is equivalent to running a regression of x on y. Okay, well, x transpose x inverse x transpose u is running a regression of x on u. So that's one way of looking at it. So what we're doing is saying, okay, there's this alpha here, and uh, x transpose x, x transpose u is alpha hat, and what we expect is that alpha hat is always zero. In other words, x adds no information to, uh, our, to be able to predict u. Uh, u is orthogonal to x, if you want to call back on a previous lecture. Uh, there is no projection of u on x, if you want to call back to a previous lecture. Uh, another way of, of thinking about this is to uh, sort of uh, think back to the time in the lectures where we were not considering OLS to be 
the uh, a reflection of the true data generating process, but merely an approximation to an unknown conditional mean. Right? Remember at the beginning of this lecture, we said one of the things we could say about OLS is that um, the expectation of y given x is this unknown DGP, and OLS provides the best linear approximation to this quantity no matter what process generates this quantity. Well, it's kind of like what we're saying up here is kind of like saying, well, uh, there's this expectation of u given x, and we're going to assume that um, there's no relationship between those two things. That the expectation of u given x is, is always zero. We could actually um, combine the assumption we made here and, and also the expectation that u equals zero to, to generate this uh, function or this assumption here. These are somewhat equivalent. Um, okay, so that's what the assumption means. There's no correlation between x and u. Uh, what we can do then is say, all right, uh, let's use this assumption to finish the proof. Well, that's kind, it's kind of one step because we're just going to say that this whole thing equals 0. And of course, this times this equals i or 1, just like we did last time. So we can just go straight to the expected value of beta hat equals beta. End of proof. So uh, what we've shown here is that there can sometimes be more than one pathway to the same answer. And uh, those pathways can differ a bit in, this, in terms of their uh, realism or the willingness to with which we are uh, we have to, with the willingness we have to accept the assumptions. Um, and actually, most encouragingly, if there are multiple pathways to an answer, we might be able to invoke the pathway that's the best um, uh, approximation to whatever particular data generating process we believe that we're facing uh, in a certain data set. Now, uh, I've been talking a lot about this um, unbiasedness property, and it's generally considered one of the more important um, properties of OLS. But what I want to do right now is uh, take a little uh, off-ramp and uh, tell you about a model uh, that is biased but still useful and so often useful. And it's, in fact, going to lead us to think about other um, definitions for usefulness for an OLS model other than unbiasedness. So uh, let's consider the auto-distributed lag model. Now, what's an auto-distributed lag model? We're going to um, suppose that we have a data set with um, lots of observations, capital N. So there's lots of different, uh, actually, I, I need to specify, these aren't just observations. These are units, something like uh, countries, uh, people, um, units of study. And then we've also got T, which is a bunch of different time observations. So what we have is some kind of model where we have maybe one unit over multiple times. That would be a panel kind of data set. Or maybe we have, or I'm sorry, that would be a time series kind of data set. Or maybe we have many units over many times, and that's what we would call a panel data set or a time series cross-sectional data set. An auto-distributed lag model could be, in principle, estimated on uh, either of those kinds of, of data sets. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is, is uh, show you that this kind of model is guaranteed to produce biased estimates of beta. And uh, the way I'm going to show you this is to um, show you uh, what we expect beta to be um, when we regress yt minus 1 on, on yt. So what I'm going to do is uh, look at uh, beta hat 1 beta one hat, um, and beta hat 1 comes out of a regression of m sub i yt on m sub i yt minus 1. Now what, do, what does this mean? This, as you may recall from last week, is uh, the residual matrix from a regression on the constant term.
or demeaning, not demeaning in the uh, denigrating sense, but demeaning in the extracting the arithmetic mean sense. So that's what mi is. And what we're doing is just saying, let's, let's get the constant beta 0 out of there. Let's just focus on beta 1, the relationship between yt and y. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this regression. So uh, what would that regression look like? Uh, well, uh, beta 1 hat would be equal to, now it's x transpose x inverse x transpose y, but the role of x will be played by m i y t minus 1. So I've got x transpose x, okay, inverse, x transpose y, and this is y right here, m, i, y, t. Okay. Now, if you remember um, when we did some proofs involving um, uh, m and p, the residual and projection matrices, we flipped these things around in such a way that um, we used the item potency of m, i, or m, any m, really, to simplify matters. And so just to show you real briefly how this is going to work here, in case you forgot, um, I can use the transpose rule to rewrite this as y t minus 1 transpose m i transpose m i y t minus 1 quantity inverse times y t minus 1 transpose m i transpose m i y t. Now, uh, one of the properties that I taught you about M and P matrices is that they are symmetric. So M equals M transpose. So that means I can write Y T minus 1 transpose M I M I Y T minus 1 inverse. Y T minus 1 transpose M I M I Y T. And now I can use the item potency of M I to write Y T minus 1 transpose M I Y T minus 1 inverse y t minus 1 transpose m i y t. Okay. Now, go ahead and move this down a little bit. Now what I'm going to do is uh, substitute this y t right here for its known value from the DGP. So what I'm going to do is write in y t minus 1 transpose m i y t minus 1 inverse y t minus 1 uh, transpose m i quantity times the quantity uh, y t minus 1 beta 1 plus u. That comes from here. So this is now going right here, like that. And now I can um, multiply these quantities out, and I think you can see where this is going. Why well, I hope you can see where this is going. Y t minus one transpose m i y t minus one inverse times y t minus one transpose m i y t minus one uh, beta one plus now I'm going to go to a second line. Things are getting crazy. Y t minus 1 transpose m i y t minus 1 inverse. Y t minus 1 transpose m i u. Now, this is the inverse of this, and hence it all dies, and we just have beta 1. What about this? This is a regression of u on mi. The problem is we're stuck. This quantity I cannot actually get out of the proof. And um, there's a reason why that we're stuck here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify that this, I'm going to come back in here and specify that this is actually u at time t. And uh, there are two reasons uh, that I can't get rid of that relationship or of this uh, this uh, boxed figure here because that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to just kill that and just get beta 1. The problem is, firstly, y t minus 1 it, uh, whoops. 
why t minus 1 is stochastic. So I can't just do that trick where I take some expectations and then uh, pass it through all of the non-stochastic components of this expression and just kill u or kill everything but u. Um, can't do that because y t minus 1 is stochastic. So if I was to come up here and say take the expectation, expectation of uh, beta 1 hat, what I'd get is beta 1, that's just going to be expected value beta 1, uh, plus the expected value of y t minus 1 transpose m i y t minus 1 inverse y t minus 1 transpose m i u t. And I'm not going to be able to just say, OK, the expectation of this equals, the expect equals this here times the expectation of u t because these things all have expected values of their own. They're stochastic, so I can't do it. Number two, and this is the real uh, tricky part or the real kind of bad thing, is that clearly, and this is always dangerous when a math person says clearly or obviously, but clearly y t uh, minus 1 is correlated with uh, u t minus 1. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, it's easier to see what I mean by that if I uh, rewrite some of these terms a little bit differently. Now I'm going to have to move all this junk down. Let's just move this all down here. Uh, there we go. Why is that? There we go. So um, I can write this uh, expression this way. Yt equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times yt minus 1 plus ut. That's the true DGP. Um, but remember that yt equals beta 0 plus beta 1. Now, yt minus 1 is actually equal to yt minus 1 hat plus ut minus 1 hat plus ut. And all this is, all, what this means is when I put in some value for, um, when I estimate errors, because in, in the estimation, um, this ut is, uh, um, how do I put this? OK, I've thought of a good way to explain this. So um, remember that um, y t minus 1 is composed of the systematic components of y t minus 1 and the random components of y t minus 1. So even if we have a perfect model of y t minus 1, um, it's going to be the case that the realized value of y t minus 1 that goes into the next period's equation is going to be composed of signal, which is this sort of x beta component, and the noise. So, uh, for example, sometimes you know uh, you, your 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 economy just has a really good year because of random influences, net of all the fundamentals of the economy, and that boom in growth in that year will influence what happens next year systematically, even though the origination of the of the uh, boom was itself random. So the random component of last year's dependent variable y is going to influence um, this year's y. And consequently, that noise component is going to be correlated with this year's noise component through this equation. Uh, all right, actually, hold on. Uh, let me take that back. Uh, this year's observed dependent variable, or this year's observed independent variable, y t minus 1, is going to be correlated with last year's error term, y t, or u t minus 1. Uh, and if you go back to our assumptions, we need to assume uh, that when we're assuming x is stochastic, uh, go up right here, oh, one more, that there's no relationship, there's no correlation between x and u. Well, now we know by construction there is. This year's value of um, the value of y t minus 1 is going to be a function in part of uh, last year's noise parameter u t minus 1. 
So what that means is that um, if I'm using a dependent variable that has noise as an independent variable later, that noise is going to pass through to the independent variable. And so now we've had this situation where noise is correlated with the regressor. So for both of these reasons, um, in colloquial terms, we are hosed. We can't rely on the proof techniques that we already used. And in fact, uh, if you don't buy this, I can show you in R, just by simulating a, an auto-distributed lag model, I can just show you that uh, it, it don't work out good. Um, think bad things happen um, from a bias perspective if you estimate these models. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's do it. So uh, let me come down here to uh, R Studio, and uh, here's the uh, lecture file for this week. Um, you can see that first what I'm doing is uh, setting a random seed. You probably talked about this in your previous uh, class. This just ensures that the random variables that I'm drawing out of my uh, R program are going to be exactly the same as the random variables that you're drawing when you run this code in your R program, even though we're running them at different times. Uh, <laughs> the reason why that's possible is because the random number generating algorithms in R are, are not truly random, at least not the, not the commonly used ones. There are ways of making them truly random, but the uh, typical ones are, are um, just deterministic functions which happen to look random. Anyway, so now what I'm going to do is draw some uh, beta values out of a... Um, well, what I'm going to do is create a matrix to store estimated values of beta hat out of the regression I'm going to run, beta hat store. And I'm just going to fill that with uh, NAs for now. So I've got two columns because I'm estimating two betas. And I've got 5,000 rows because I'm estimating 5,000 beta, uh, 5,000 runs of this regression. Uh, and I'm going to name the columns of this matrix. Whoops, move that around there. I'm going to name the columns of this matrix uh, constant and lag. So if I were to do, whoops. If I were to do uh, head b hat store, now it would uh, indicate that the first column was my estimates of the constant term and the second column was my estimates of the lag term. Uh, now the next line is uh, setting up a progress bar. Um, PB is arrow text progress bar min zero max 5000 style three. What does this mean? Well, what this means is it's uh, when I run through this loop, I am going to, uh, R is going to dis display a text progress bar that shows how long this loop is, per, uh, is gone. It's going to start at zero and go to 5,000, which matches the number of replications I'm running of this particular model. Um, and style three just says it's going to put a percentage indicator out here saying what percentage of the run is done. Now, uh, this is the for loop that's going to actually run my real um, simulation here. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, set text progress bar at the equal uh, to equal the value of j, which is to say that um, whatever iteration of this loop that I'm on, tell the text progress bar function that's where I am. And you'll see how that creates a nice visual display here in a few minutes. Uh, what I want to do then is t uh, create an auto distributed lag model out of some fake data process. And so what I've done is I've said that beta 0 is 0.435 and beta 1 is 0.859. So y i plus 1, so y at time i plus 1 equals 0.435 plus 0.859 times y in the previous period i plus a normally distributed random error term. And that goes from i equals 1 to 30. So when i equals 1, y2 equals blah, 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 y1, right? That's why I had to create y1 up here, because I had to start at a certain time and just sort of pull a the first, the starting initialized value of y out of thin air. That's where I pulled it from. I just said it myself. So I'm going to create this data set, and when I create this data set, I'm going to get a string of y's out of an auto-distributed lag model. Let me just, I'm going to just feed it a value of j and show you what goes on here. So if I go ahead and run this, uh, and then type y, what I've got is a data set of length 31. And uh, the data set of length 31 um, is all the different values of the dependent variable through the, through the 31 periods of the model. Now what I want to do is run a regression of yt against yt minus 1. And so um, it turns out that even though I have 31 observations, 
I only have 30 observations of the independent variable. Why is that the case? Well, because yt equals yt minus 1 plus error. And uh, for the observation of uh, the lag term, yt minus 1, I don't have that observation of the lag for the first dependent variable in my data set. So I sort of have to chop off that first observation because I don't have an x that corresponds to it. So I create two variables. Uh, y standard equals y2 to 31, so the last 30 uh, observations. And then my x variable is y1 to 30, which is the first 30 observations of the dependent variable. I just put uh, a, an x matrix together, which is a combination of the constant and the y lag. And then I run a regression where I say, OK, uh, beta hat equals x transpose x inverse x transpose y, where x is just 1 in the lag. Uh, and then I store that result in the row corresponding to the particular value of j this time around. So if I just run this little bit right here, b hat, there's my betas from my toy regression. And if I go to head b hat store, you can see they've been chunked in in my storage matrix for the first run. Uh, the constant. Uh, ended up going right here. There's where my const estimate was, and there's my uh, estimate for the lag of y. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this 5,000 times. And you'll, it'll become apparent pretty soon why I'm doing this. Let me just run this 5,000 times. You can see there's the text progress bar running merrily across the way to show how much of the uh, result has been finished. So now I've got this beta hat store matrix with 5,000 replications of getting a data set, generating a data set out of the DGP, and then running a model and seeing how close the model gets to the true, uh, the true um, DGP. And each data set is a little different because of this right here, this normally distributed error, which is never quite the same each time. And it represents randomly you know, uh, repeating the observation of the world out of the same DGP over and over and over again. If this model is unbiased, it should be the case that that repeating of the estimation process um, is on average an accurate reflection of the true DGP. So the true DGP is 0 0.435 plus 0.859 times uh, yt minus 1. Alas, it doesn't happen. Here's the mean of our estimates minus the true value for this is for the constant, and this is for the, and this here is for the um, beta coefficient on yt minus 1. Those numbers are not zero, they're not even close to zero. In fact, I've made a couple of plots for you here. So let me just throw those plots up there. So actually, I'm going to throw this one up first. So this is the bias in the estimated constant for the auto-distributed lag model. Let me uh, open this up a little bit. Um, on the x-axis, what I have here is the estimate that I got out of each of the 5,000 um, uh, re repetitions of this um, process. And this is the estimated PDF, or probability density function, uh, for that group of observations. The true value is supposed to be 0.435, and so that's indicated by this uh, small dotted line here. The thick dotted line is the actual mean estimate from my 5,000 replications. And what you can see is my estimates for the constant term are too big on average. And in particular, they skew right. They skew too big. Similarly, for the uh, beta term, uh, it should the, the actual value of the beta term should be um, 0.859 for the coefficient on y t minus one. But our um, series, our estimation procedure is skewing left in terms of its estimates for this parameter, and the mean of that estimate is is too low by a considerable margin. It's biased downward. So we're getting constants on average that are too large and coefficients that are too small. That's a problem uh, in terms of our substantive understanding of how things would work if we use this model in the real world. We would um, misstate the true relationship that exists. Uh, what I've just done is an example of a Monte Carlo study. I wanted to know how a particular um, estimator performed in a certain environment. And so in order to discover that, I um, did an experiment, a simulated experiment, where I said, here, I know what the world is for sure. 
I want to see how well this estimator recovers the world. Um, and uh, I can I can do that in this special case because in in on this you know little blackboard I control the world, uh, and it's it's pretty troubling when uh, even when you control the world and all the parameters are known, um, an accurately specified model does not recover the true coefficients. That's troubling. Um, even when I'm right, I'm wrong. That's not a good sign. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, geez, ADLs sure do suck. Uh, but they, they get published all the time and they get used all the time. And there is a reason for that. And so now I want to talk a little bit about why it is anyone ever uses these. And the answer is they actually do turn out to be useful under um, a circumstance which is hopefully not too uncommon in political science. Uh, incidentally, it occurs to me that you may not have seen one of the functions that I used in this R uh, code before uh, coming down here. You may not have seen the density function. The density function is a way of recovering information about a probability density out of data set. So you feed it in a vector and it spits back out its best guess at the probability density out of which that, or any whatever density, uh, that data came out of. It operates um, in a way similar to the Nadaraya Watson non-parametric estimate of the mean that we've talked about in the past, um, except instead of estimating um, y given x, it estimates the frequency of x given x. And its estimate of the frequency of x is a weighted average of the number of occurrences of x near any particular value. So for example, coming down here to this uh, ADL model um, density plot, when the estimate of the coefficient on y t minus 1 is 0.4. We see in the data set we expect roughly, I don't know, this, the density is about 0.25, so some frequency um, associated with that outcome, you know, maybe 10% or something, of the observer, or maybe actually closer to 2%, 3%, are around that area. Um, so what it's, all it's doing is just saying, well, uh, take the number of observations um, proximate to this particular value of x and derive a frequency estimate out of the weighted kernel weighted number of observations that are near that estimate. Uh, the kernel weighting happens by a variety of kernels or, uh, as, or a variety of kernels are options. Uh, I believe the default for density might be the Apachnikov kernel, but they're generally speaking downward sloping bell-shaped weight functions is similar looking to the normal distribution. So getting back here, uh, I've shown that ADL models are biased, uh, but an ADL model um, might be consistent. Um, in fact, it is consistent, um, which is useful, but before you could know that, it requires me to find what consistency means. What do I mean when I say consistency? What I mean when I say consistency is the limit as n approaches infinity of uh, the expectation of beta hat equals beta. Um, so what am I talking about here? Well, um, limits are uh, different from expectations in the sense that um, expectations are true regardless of sample size. Um, so unbiasedness is a property of E beta hat alone regardless of the sample size. Now it might be the case that in very small samples our estimate of beta hat is going to be quite variable and in fact it will be very variable. There will be a lot of variation in it. But if you did it a large number of times, a thousand times, on average, you'd hit the center of the, uh, you'd hit the right um, target. It's just that your pattern would be very spread out. You'd be missing a lot, but on average, you would be hitting the center if your sample were small. Consistency um, is a property of large. In fact, technically of infinitely sized samples. 
so uh, consistency is sort of like unbiasedness, except it requires us to have a huge sample in order for us to be able to invoke that property. Uh, in your homework, you're going to prove prove the consistency of auto-distributed lag models by repeating my Monte Carlo simulation in ever larger samples and showing that you do get convergence of estimates of beta 0 and beta 1 uh, to the tr their true values as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But we can actually formally prove this property as well, and uh, we're going to do so right now. So, uh, okay. Um, let me state some uh, state some basic uh, characteristics here, and then we'll move on to the proof. So I'm going to go down here. Um, for a stochastic, uh, so well, let me just write this first. E of beta hat, generally speaking, is equal to um, beta plus x transpose x inverse x transpose u. And the problem with the ADL model that we ran into is that um, this was not equal to zero, right, in our particular case. Uh, for a stochastic quantity, a y prime, or a y one, rather, we will say, that's not prime, that's a one, We will say that the probability limit as n approaches infinity is equal to a0 if the limit as n approaches infinity of the probability that the distance between this value, oh, looks like <laughs> looks like that wasn't one at all. That was just a mark on my uh, note. So for stochastic quantity a y, we will say that the probability limit as n approaches infinity is equal to a zero if the limit as n approaches infinity of that the probability that the distance between a y and a zero is less than epsilon equals one for small epsilon. So what am I saying here? Uh, well, what I'm saying is, let me move this down again, uh, the distance between um, some function of the random quantity y, that's a y, to the point a0. So the gap between our estimate and the true value of some quantity uh, goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So in our case, our estimate of these beta coefficients the distance from that estimate to the true value needs to go to zero as n goes to gets really, really big, goes to infinity. And uh, the reason that we, well, we're going to write this as the following. Uh, P lim, or probability limit, as n goes to infinity of a y equals a zero. And the reason we write this as a probability limit is that y is a random quantity. So y isn't always the same. And what that means is that this distance that we're interested in, which is to say this distance right here, the Euclidean norm, is also going to be a random quantity. So we can't talk about it in terms of constants. We have to talk about it in terms of probabilities. And what we want to, what we want to be true is that the probability that that distance is real small, which is to say less than epsilon, has to get close to 1 as n gets close to infinity. So because y is random, that distance is never truly going to be 0 as long as y retains some randomness. But for very large samples, 
we should be able to get narrower and narrower and narrower in our estimates to the point where they're so close that the deviation between the true value and the estimated value gets it gets vanishingly tiny. That's colloquially what we're saying here. Uh, and it might be uh, simpler uh, to uh, write an example of this. Um, it might be simpler to, to say, for example, what's the probability limit? So we're going to write this as an example. What's the probability limit as n goes to infinity of y bar, which is the average value of y? Well, what that's going to be equal to is the probability limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n sum from i is 1 to n y i, which is this is the mean of y. Uh, why is that true? Well, we know it's true because the expectation of y bar equals the expectation of 1 over n sum of i equals 1 to n y i. 1 over n is a constant, so we can rewrite this as 1 over n times the expected value. Whoops, I kind of wrote that as a combination of a bracket and an e. Uh, the expected value of uh, the sum of i equals 1 to n y i. Now, this is a sum of numbers, and a law of expectation says that the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations. What's our expectation for y i? Well, our expectation for y i is the mean. <laughs> so what we have is uh, 1 over n times uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n of mu y, which is to say 1 over n times n times mu y, which is to say mu y. Um, that shows us that we're on target, that the average is on target. But we also need to show that there's going to be some residual variability in that estimate. And that residual variability goes to 0 as the sample gets larger and larger. So this is only like. We might write this as only being the first step. We also need to show that the variance in y bar converges. The variance of the sample mean converges to the population mean. So in case I'm throwing terms around a bit cavalierly, this is the sample mean of y for any given sample. And this is the true population mean. So uh, it's not enough to show that the sample mean is an expectation equal to the population mean. If we want the sample mean to be consistent, we also must show that the variability in the sample mean converges to 0. So if you put those two facts together, the variability gets smaller and smaller. The estimate is an average on target, so the distance between the uh, target and the particular estimate is going to get converged to 0. Um, so the variance of y bar, or the sample mean of y, is equal to uh, 1 over n squared times the quantity i equals 1 to n sigma squared. Um, how do we know that that's true? Well, it turns out that there's a law of uh, variances. The variation of a random quantity x times a fixed constant a is a squared var x, where x is random and a is a constant. So um, we're just using this fact because uh, in, in our proof up here because what we've there's an intermediate step that I've omitted. That intermediate step, if I sort of scroll over here, is uh, I want to know the variance of 1 over n sum i in 1 to n of, uh, whoops, of y i. And so I'm saying the variance of that quantity equals this constant n squared times the sum of each individual variance of each individual y. 
how do I know uh, that this second part is true? In other words, how can I take this part and write it as this? Well, the reason I can do that is because <laughs> now I'm going to have to grab this stuff. Take this stuff, move it down here. Take this stuff, move it down here. So how do I know that I can rewrite this bit right here as this bit right here? Well, I know that because I can think of each observation y as being what so the observed or the observed yi is equal to some true y, which is to say like u y, plus a random error component i. And I'm going to assume that u i is distributed independently and identically with variance sigma squared. And it's a property of random variables that the variance of x plus y, where x and y are random, is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y plus 2 times the covariance of x and y. Well, because I've assumed that these u components are independently and identically distributed, that must mean that this covariance term equals 0 because they're independently distributed. So in other words, they're not, they don't covary with each other at all. They're not related to each other. Their covariance is zero. The regression of some components of the error of other components of the error would, would yield zero. So this bit right here is just saying I can take the variance of these individual random variables y and I can add them all up and I don't need to worry about the covariance terms because by definition they're equal to zero. Uh, so what this gets us is this quantity. Uh, I might need to move this down a little bit. Let's go ahead and move this down a little bit. Hmm. Oh, OK, we won't move that down a little bit. Um, What I'll do instead is copy that. No. Oh, OneNote. <laughs> you piece of crap. OK, so uh, I'm just going to rewrite it the old-fashioned way. Uh, the variance of y bar equals 1 over n squared plus the sum from i equals 1 to n. Or I'm sorry, this is times. My, my apologies, times the sum of y equals 1 to n uh, sigma squared. Or, in other words, 1 over n squared times n sigma squared, which is 1 over n sigma squared. Now, remember, we're taking the probability limit, so we need to figure out the limit of this thing as n goes to infinity. What's the limit of 1 over n times a constant? And no matter what that constant is, well, that's going to go to 1 over infinity times some constant or 0. So that's the second part of what we needed. We need to know that our estimate is on target, and the variability of that estimate goes to 0 as our sample gets infinitely large. So 1, estimate on target. 2, variability in estimate. diminishes to nil in large samples. So that's how we know the probability limit of a sample mean um, is consistent in the sense of uh, uh, giving an accurate estimate in large samples 
um, of the population mean. Uh, it's important to reemphasize that probability limits are not the same as expectations. Expectations hold in small samples or in large samples. Consistency results only hold in large samples. Furthermore, it's also the case that the expectation of some function of y is not necessarily equal to the function of the expectation of y, where f here is just f is just any old function. But uh, the p limb as n goes to infinity of f of y, nice infinity there, uh, equals f of the p limb as n goes to infinity of y. So there's a substitution you can make in probability limits that you can't make uh, uh, in, in expectations. So consistency results are actually easier to obtain in some cases. Okay, so now I've filled you in on what consistency means. Now what I'm going to do is show that ADLs, by this definition, are consistent by making one assumption, which is that the expectation between u at time t and x of time t equals 0. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, write down that beta equals beta hat plus x transpose x inverse x transpose u. And that's where we left off in our, in our little proof here. Here's, um, there it is. This is expectation of beta hat. There's beta. This is x transpose x, x transpose u. It's just that the role of x is being played by yt minus 1 prime mi, or yt minus 1 m, mi. So uh, what I want to do now is uh, take p limbs of this thing. And actually, that shouldn't be a plus. That should be an equal sign. Uh, what I'm going to do is take a p limb as n goes to infinity of beta, and then on the other side, I'm going to take the p limb as n goes to infinity of beta hat plus x transpose x inverse x transpose u. Uh, now, I've just shown you some substitutions that I can, uh, I can make. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is say the p limb of this thing uh, equals mm, how do I want to write this? Ah, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna write it like this instead. I'm gonna write it as beta minus beta hat equals x transpose x inverse x transpose u. And then I'm going to take p limbs at this point. p limb goes to infinity of the quantity x transpose x inverse x transpose u. Uh, now, uh, what I can do is multiply by a tricky form of 1. And that multiplying by that tricky form of 1 is going to enable me to do something. Um, so let me just rewrite this and then show you what I did. n x transpose x inverse n x transpose u. 1 over, 1 over. So this thing here is inversed right there. There's the inverse. This is not. So basically what I've done is multiplied by n over n, 1 over n over 1 over n. So I've multiplied by, uh, going over here, 1 over n inverse, 1 over n, or n over n, or 1. So that little multiplication move didn't change anything. It's just going uh, <laughs> to let me do something um, tricky. And what that something is, is I'm going to be able to dispose of infinite sums. So x transpose x is a, uh, a squared sum of, of x's. And if I didn't have that 1 over n in there, as I let x go or I let n go to infinity, you just get bigger and bigger and bigger x sums. Multiplying by 1 over n is going to shrink those back down um, to, to be finite. So now what I've got is, whoops, I can break this up as
And I wouldn't be able to do this with expectations, as I just uh, let you know. Oops, that should be x. Um, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just call this thing s x transpose x, which is a name for it. It's going to be some quantity. Uh, and then I'm going to say that's multiplied by uh, 1 over n, or I'm sorry, the p limit. of 1 over n times the sum as i equals 1, or I'm sorry, as t equals 1 to n of x, oh no, that's, that sh, yeah, that should be t, of x transpose ut. So I'm getting back into the time element here. All I've done is just take this column and written it out as a sum again. Um, we can assume it is reasonable to assume that x transpose u, or the sum from i equals 1 to n of x i u t, or I'm sorry, it's, uh, this should be, I'm screwing up my subscripts. There we go. x t u t equals 0. Should be t. Why is that um, reasonable to assume? Well, it's reasonable to assume precisely because if you go all the way back to our auto distributed lag model, there's nothing that links. Um, where do I go here? So remember that the problem here, going back to the original uh, section, was that um, we had a correlation that was pretty much obvious in the ADL model between yt minus 1 and ut minus 1. Um, because, I'm going down to here, yt minus 1 is by definition composed of a signal element and a bit of noise element. Um, so we're not going to be able to say, so we can't say uh, that all the x and all u for all t are uncorrelated. That was the nature of the problem. We can, however, say that x at time t and u at time t are uncorrelated because going back up to the model, x at time t is y t minus 1, x at time t, or I'm sorry, u at time t is u t, and it's reasonable to assume that these two aren't correlated because even if, even though uh, it's the case, that um, y t minus 1 is composed of y hat t minus 1 and u hat t minus 1, these two things are not necessarily, and in fact, typically not, correlated. So as long as we can assume that the error terms are not correlated across time, it's reasonable to assume that this x, which is a composite of last year's error, last time's error, and last year's signal, is not correlated with this year's error. Now, of course, all this is going to fall apart if the errors are truly correlated across time. Then, you know, all bets are off, and this, this consistency proof is no longer going to work. But if we can make that assumption, if we can jump to that or, or not really jump to that conclusion, but just simply... Um, rest our uh, rest on that assumption. Uh, then we can say, okay, this here is uh, equal to the following. So we go up here and say
p limb to n uh, p limb as n goes to infinity of beta hat minus beta equals s x transpose x times the probability limit of the expected relationship between x and u, which is just zero. So we get that the probability limit of the gap between our estimates and our beta, our true value of beta is zero, and everything is okay. So to summarize what we've talked about, uh, as long as u t and u t minus one are uncorrelated for all t from one to however long the time is, say capital T, uh, then an ADL or auto distributed lag model is consistent. Now we've spent a lot of time uh, naturally talking about whether um, our estimates of beta are um, in any way related <laughs> to the actual values of beta. And uh, sometimes the answer is yes in all sample sizes. Sometimes the answer is yes only in very large samples as we've shown. Now what we want to talk about is, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but um, getting beta right on average is not the only important question. It's also important to know how variable our estimates of beta hat are. Um, just because something is right on average doesn't necessarily mean it's useful. If the variability in our estimates is enormous, then the fact that if we did it a thousand times, the cloud of a thousand estimates would be centered on the true beta is not particularly useful because in, point, in, in fact, we only have one estimate of beta hat that we get from our one data set and we want the variability of our estimate to be low enough that that one estimate is informative about the true state of the world. So uh, the first step on, on figuring out whether this estimate is worth anything is trying to figure out how variable our estimate uh, is. And to know that, we need to know the variance in beta hat. Well, what's the variance in beta hat? Uh, well, beta hat is, um, or, I'm sorry, the variance in any quantity I should, sorry, I should rewrite this. The variance in any, in any quantity is just equal to um, the sum of squares of deviations of the quantity from its average. Uh, so in other words, if I write it out for beta hat here, if I take beta hat and subtract its expectation, and then I sum the squares of that, I get the variance. Oh. Put the transpose in the wrong place. There we go. Uh, this is the, um, what is this going to give me in a matrix sense? Well, um, think about beta hat as being a you know, vector of betas here, beta 1, beta 2. We'll just use two of them. And there's going to be two um, expected values. We'll call the you know, mu 1 and mu 2. Those are going to be our mean beta hats or expected values of beta hat. Uh, and so this subtraction quantity here is just beta 1, beta 2, and each one's going to be minus mu 1 minus mu 2. And then we're going to take that and multiply it by its transpose. Beta 1, mu 1, beta 2, minus mu 2. So that's what we've got. Uh, and so using our row by column uh, estimates here, uh, what we get is... beta 1 minus mu 1 squared, beta 1 minus mu 1 times beta 1 minus mu 2, beta 2 minus mu 2, sorry, uh, beta 2 minus mu 2, beta uh, times beta 1 minus mu 1, and beta 2 minus mu 2 squared. So we've got a 2 by 2 matrix and that makes sense because this is a 2 by 1 matrix this is a 1 by 2 matrix so the result should be a 2 by 2 matrix uh, this is the variance covariance matrix it tells you um, how much beta varies this is the variance of beta and how much or beta 1 this is the variance of beta 2 
And this is how much beta 1 co-varies with beta 2. So in other words, how much of our estimates of beta 1 and beta 2, how much do they move together? Um, I should actually uh, be clear about this, because it is a little important to recognize that these are the estimates of beta, not the true values of beta. So you might come in here and put a hat in on all of these to remind you these are all properties of the estimates. What we want to know is um, how accurate is our estimate of, of beta. And actually, it's even more informative to maybe write in, well, we know because of the unbiasedness of OLS that the expected value of beta hat is actually just the true value of beta. As long as we've got an unbiased estimate, that's, that's so. So we can come in and write in, okay, beta 1 minus beta 1 hat minus beta 1, beta 2 hat minus beta 2. We can come in and substitute there. Right. So that should make it even clearer that what we've got here, I'm going to write in all those betas. Uh, beta 1, beta 1, beta 2, beta 2, beta 1, beta 2. What we have here is a bunch of variances and covariances of beta hat with respect to its mean, or the or the true value of uh, beta hat. Now another uh, way, or well, actually that's that's actually really all I, I need to say. Um, the one the one thing I want to add to that though, uh, I'm going to come down here and move these just a bit further, is um, this thing here. Uh, I can rewrite this two by two matrix as variance of beta one hat. Uh, whoops covariance beta 1 hat beta 2 hat covariance beta 2 hat beta 1 hat and these two will be equal and the variance of beta 2 hat these two matrices this one and this one mean the same thing and this is what we like to call the VCV or variance covariance matrix of beta hat. And I've done it for a, uh, an example where beta hat is a vector of length 2, so there are two coefficients here, but the same principle applies for a vector of length 10 or 20 or 100. Um, all that changes is that this number of variance and covariance terms gets larger and larger, and the ultimate VCV matrix will end up being k by k, where k is the number of elements of beta hat. Now, so far I've been writing this a little bit abstractly. Um, in other words, I haven't done anything that you can actually estimate on data yet. I'm just talking about, in general, this thing called a variance. So what we kind of need to know is uh, what is beta hat minus beta for any particular observation. Uh, well, um, beta hat minus beta is going to be equal to x transpose x inverse x transpose u. How do we know that? Well, beta hat is x transpose x inverse x transpose y, right? And beta is x transpose x inverse x transpose, uh, well, hold on, I should. Beta is equal to how do I write this? All right, I know how I want to write this, so I'm actually going to erase this and say uh, beta hat is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. We know that y equals x beta plus u in the real DGP, right? So if we were to um, do our usual kind of stuff and pre-multiply both sides um, by x transpose x inverse x transpose, we get x transpose x inverse y, beta plus x transpose x inverse x transpose u, right? This here from there is beta, whoops, is beta hat. So beta hat equals beta plus x transpose x inverse x transpose u. And ergo, beta hat minus beta equals x transpose x inverse x transpose u. So that's how we know that beta minus beta hat equals that quantity. So now what we can do is come in here and say, okay, we've got a bunch of, um, this, is, this is the um, uh, variance term that we're trying to estimate, beta minus expected value of beta hat times beta hat 
minus the expected value beta hat. So what we're going to do is substitute this in for this. So I'm going to come down here and write the variance of beta hat, just write this over again, is equal to beta hat minus expected value of beta hat times beta hat minus the expected value of beta hat transpose, which is equal to beta hat minus beta times beta hat minus beta transpose. And uh, this is what we get via unbiasedness of OLS. Uh, then I can take this bit and plug it in right here and here. So I get x transpose x inverse x transpose u times x transpose x inverse x transpose u transpose. A uh, real nice uh, matrix uh, <laughs> playground. So uh, now we just got to use a bunch of rules of transposes to get rid of everything and make it look pretty. Um, x transpose x inverse x transpose u is going to be, okay, so I've got a transpose here. So I'm going to say this is A and this is B. So I want uh, B transpose A transpose x transpose x inverse x transpose transpose. I'm going to just do that again. Whoops, wrote a u when I meant an x. x transpose x inverse x transpose u u transpose. Now x transpose x transpose transpose times x transpose x inverse transpose. And I'm going to save us all a lot of time and just we know we've done this before. So I can rewrite this as x transpose x inverse x transpose u, u transpose x times x transpose x inverse. There you go. Uh, well, we're just about done. Now what we can do is say, all right, we, let's use some facts. Uh, assumption 3 tells us the expected value of u is 0, and e, ui, uj, or you, I should say, the expected value of any ter particular term uh, a u is 0, and the expected value of ui uj is also equal to sigma squared by a sum. Or, I'm sorry. Let me write all this over again, since I screwed up pretty much everything I could have. So the expected value of uh, any particular term ui uh, is equal to sigma squared, uh, which is to say that the variance of any term ui is homoscedastic. Uh, secondly, for any two terms, their covariance is going to be 0. And both of these things, going back up here, are given by assumption 3. So these things are true because we assume them to be true in A3. And uh, so are these things, or this thing, I guess. And that means we can say, all right, what is UU transpose? Well, UU transpose is a matrix. U is n by 1. U transpose is 1 by n. So UU transpose is n by n. Its on diagonal elements are going to be equal to u1 squared, u2 squared, and so on. Its off diagonal elements are going to be equal to u1, u2, u1, u3, and so on. u2, u3, u1, u2, and so on. u1, u3, u2, u3, and so on. Like that that's going to be u, u prime. And that's something we actually made reference to very, very far back when we were talking about matrix algebra. Uh, I, I sort of hinted that, hey, 
uh, we need to know what a vector times its transpose equals, what kind of structure it's going to be, because that's going to become really important. Well, now it's really important. There it is right there. Um, it's important because UU transpose has that form. And now we can use these assumptions to say every single one of the on diagonal elements, all of these, U3 squared there, I can replace those with sigma squared, sigma squared, and all the off diagonal elements, like those, I can replace with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, sigma squared, and so on. Right. So I can rewrite this bit right here as this matrix. And furthermore, I can write that matrix as sigma squared i n by n, where i is an n by n identity matrix. So this is going to make things uh, boil down very, very fast. So going up here and rewriting uh, this little equation right here, what I've got is x transpose x inverse x transpose sigma squared um, i x x transpose x inverse now this is a scalar constant so I can move it outside I can move it over here that's gonna give me x transpose x inverse x transpose i x x transpose x inverse i times anything any matrix is just itself again so now we have sigma squared x transpose x inverse x transpose x, x transpose x inverse. Uh, now I can say, okay, any matrix times its inverse is i or 1. So finally I get sigma squared x transpose x inverse. Great. So this is another one of those formulas you might consider tattooing on your arm. This is uh, the matrix formula that gives you the variance of your beta hat estimates. So this is the this is the formula. This right here is the formula for uh, whoops variance beta hat, aka the VCV matrix for your regression. So that's the formula you, uh, that Stata or R or any of these programs use to give you the friendly standard, standard errors that come out of your matrices or come out of your regressions. Um, it's just the diagonal elements of this matrix, uh, square root of that. <laughs> that's it. That's all the standard error is. Um, now I, I've got one little bit uh, thing, one little thing, not really a little thing that I've left out. Uh, so sigma squared, you know, is the estimate, uh, or I'm sorry, is um, ui squared. That's true by assumption. It's the homoscedasticity assumption. Uh, but we need a way to estimate that. So we need a way to estimate uh, sigma squared or the expected value of ui squared. But this is actually trickier than it looks. This is tricky. The reason why it's tricky uh, is goes back to something we learned about OLS a while ago. Uh, what we learned about OLS a while ago uh, whoops, is the following. So you may remember that OLS can be thought of um, as, a, as a geometric construction. Uh, if we've got some variable y here and some variable x, what OLS regression does is it tries to uh, pick the line or pick the beta that stretches x out to a point like so. where u hat is minimized. And as we learned, u hat is minimized when the angle between those two things is, is right, and it's 90 degrees. Um, the problem here is, unless beta hat equals beta exactly, 
um, the length of u is necessarily going to be the uh, bigger than the length of u hat because u hat is chosen as a minimum. So in other words, it's unlikely that the true beta hat is exactly equal to the beta hat that we picked because there's noise in our estimate and that noise is being uh, is creating error that OLS is trying to minimize. That means this error vector here is going to be real is going to be as small as it can be. Um, the real error vector may not be at a right angle to x. Who knows? Uh, and its length is going to be at best the same length as you had and often longer. Uh, a way of sort of summarizing this qualitatively is that OLS underestimates u. u hat is an underestimate of u because OLS minimizes u hat squared. Uh, so one over n u transpose u. Or, or, I'm sorry, u hat transpose u hat, or the variance of u hat underestimates the variance of u. Uh, it can be shown, and I'm, I'm not going to bother doing this, but I just want to let you know that it can be shown, it can be proved that the expected value of 1 over n u hat transpose u hat equals n over k uh, over n sigma squared um, or the expected value of u hat transpose u hat equals n times n over k divided by n sigma hat squared or sigma squared rather where k is the rank of x. Um, I There are multiple proofs of this uh, statement. I am not going to um, show them to you right now, but you could find a proof, uh, for example, on page uh, 107 to 110 of Davidson and McKinnon. If you wanted to look that up, it's there in your book. Um, you will uh, prove, quote unquote, this statement in your homework using simulation. Simulation is not a formal proof, but it'll at least give you some evidence that in fact it is true. Uh, but I'm just going to uh, ask you to accept the, you know, to accept that I've read the proof and that it's true, uh, and uh, go to the next step, which is that it must be that sigma hat squared. Uh, equals 1 over n minus k sigma hat 0 squared um, equals 1 over n minus k u hat transpose u hat. So all, all that we're doing here is saying this is kind of our, uh, whoops, this is kind of our naive estimate of the variability in y or in the error term, I should say, the variable in the error term. And this is our way of upweighting that error term to inflate it a little bit. Um, instead of dividing by n like we would normally, we're going to divide by n minus k. So normally we, you know, normally the variance of some quantity is one over n y transpose y. We are going to calculate one over n minus k. Y tran or well in this case u hat transpose u hat because this is smaller than this or I'm sorry it's uh, <laughs> or the exact opposite of what I meant it's larger there's a bigger number or a smaller number in the denominator so the total quantity is bigger so all that rounds up to, or rounds out to the following uh, finding. The variance covariance of matrix 
of some estimate of beta hat equals x transpose x negative 1 times the quantity 1 over n minus k u hat transpose u hat. All right, so now uh, I want to wrap up by talking about some properties of this variance-covariance matrix uh, that we've just constructed. Uh, it turns out that um, the estimates of the variance-covariance matrix that come out of OLS are the most efficient estimates possible with a linear model, which is to say they're the smallest possible accurate estimates of the variance uh, or the variability in beta hat. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're smallest possible uh, estimates. So, for example, I could just say by fiat that my uh, variance uh, is epsilon. Bam. Like, I'm going to estimate with OLS and uh, I'm just going to say that my standard errors are all zero or very close to zero. Uh, the problem is that'd be wrong. Uh, and, and specifically, I mean a very, a very specific thing by wrong. What I mean by that is that uh, the 95% confidence intervals for the beta hat that came out of this estimate, oops, I should say that, came out of this estimate, would not cover the true beta 95% of the time. And in my stupid example here, I suspect it would uh, cover the true beta a very, very small proportion of the time because the variability is so is way too narrow. So um, the OLS estimates of the variance of beta hat are the most efficient or smallest es variance estimates for which this is true. Uh, and in fact, there's a way of uh, stating this a little more formally, um, which is the so-called Gauss-Markov theorem. Uh, this is in your Davidson and McKinnon book, if you care to look it up. So the Gauss-Markov theorem says that if the expected value of the error term given x, and this is the true error term, not the OLS x, uh, estimate of the error term, if that correlation is 0, or I'm sorry, let me take that back. If u has mean 0 for every value of x, and uh, the error term is homoscedastic, so that's what this means here, if the error term is homoscedastic, and the model is properly specified, so that assumption 1, in other words, holds, then the OLS estimator beta hat is more efficient, which is to say lower variance, than any other linear unbiased estimator. So this is uh, sort of jumping down a bit. OLS is the best linear unbiased estimator under the five assumptions that I've laid out if those, assu if those assumptions are correct. Other estimators might be more efficient. They might have tighter variances. Uh, but that could only be true if they were nonlinear, possibly, or maybe biased. Um, and and uh, we can't do better in an unbiased estimator than OLS. That's what Gauss-Markov is telling us. Uh, now, I've listed the assumptions that are necessary to sustain this proof so that you know them. Uh, if you want to see the actual proof, see the book. It's it's a little bit involved. Specifically, see the Davidson and McKinnon text, which has a, a, a proof of this. Uh, what I'd rather spend my time talking about is this uh, bias variance trade off that we're uh, presupposing here. Bias variance trade off. Now, I don't want to talk about this too much because it's not necessarily one of the uh, core uh, things uh, or core topics of OLS. Um, but it's worth noting that estimators can be unbiased and they can be efficient or low, low variance. And um, what the Gauss-Markov theor theorem is telling us is if we look at all the possible linear estimators for which the bias is zero, Okay, I just made up, this is like estimator 1, estimator 2, and these are linear estimators, linear estimator 1, linear estimator 2, and OLS. OLS is going to be, actually, I, I, I should rewrite this graph because I, I believe it's a little misleading the way I've written it. Let me try this again. 
because the reason I, I, I think it's misleading is because OLS is an unbiased estimator. So where, if you were to put OLS on this graph, it's actually going to be more like a point. <laughs> nice. It's going to be more like a point. Oh, wow. Apparently that means it thinks I'm erasing it. Let's try this. Let's just make my pen thicker. Okay, here's OLS. It has a zero bias and, um, and some variance determined by the formulas I've given you. Now, there might be other linear estimators. So I might have some other linear estimate 1, and I might have some other linear estimate 2. And LE1 and LE2 are unbiased, because I've written them that way. But they're less efficient than OLS. Their var the variance in beta hat for those estimators is larger, larger than it has to be. So what, o what bl the blue assumption, appropriately blue in the marker here, is telling us is that of all the linear estimators that are unbiased that are possible, OLS gets you the best, most efficient estimates. That doesn't mean we could not do better on variance. And uh, there are two ways we could do better. First of all, perhaps we could come up with some kind of nonlinear estimator. that's unbiased and more efficient. What would that estimator look like? Who knows? But the Gauss-Markov theorem is just sort of saying uh, we're not considering that in the class of, of, of comparative estimators that we're looking at. So it's not that OLS is the best thing uh, under the sun. It's just the best linear thing under the sun. And furthermore, it's the best linear unbiased thing under the sun. So maybe we could... Um, uh, write a linear estimator. I can, oh, I'm going to make the thick one here. I could make a linear estimator, 3, that uh, is biased but lower variance. And going back to my earlier analogy of uh, shooting at a target, you can think of it a, a, a little like this. So here's my target, and I've got a bullseye in the center of that target. Okay, there's my bullseye. I'm going to move that around so it's kind of in the center. Um, here's OLS. I've got my blue pin for OLS. OLS is going to shoot, and it's going to get uh, an unbiased estimate with uh, some kind of variance that's lower than all the other alternative estimators. This nonlinear, uh, I'm sorry, this, this uh, a linear estimator that's biased might be very, very efficient, just like that. The problem is it's biased, right? It hits the wrong target. So we're shooting at the center of the target, which is you know the true beta. Our data points here, or our, our little our dots, are OLS estimates of beta hat. The gray are some other estimates, but biased in some way. And whether this gray cloud is better than this blue cloud is not necessarily an automatic decision. You might say, well, the blue cloud is an automatic decision. Um, but, but not necessarily. S suppose, for example, OLS had a very, very, very wide um, variance such that it wasn't really giving you a lot of information in any one particular sample. So, for example, if OLS had a really wide uh, estimator cloud here, or estimate cloud here, you wouldn't know in any one sample if you had that one or that one. <laughs> and hence, uh, the estimates aren't going to be terribly useful. Uh, in, that in that case, it might be better to accept a little bit of bias and uh, get a lot more certainty or a lot less variability in your estimates. So it's not necessarily this is the, the Gauss Markov theorem does not prove hands down that OLS is the you know the best thing to do. It's just telling you that of all the linear unbiased estimates you can get, it will be the best. And again, emphasizing if assumptions one through five are true, specifically if uh, U has um, at the expected value of zero given x is zero, expected value of U given x is zero, if U is homoscedastic and if the model is properly specified. So that is assumptions 1, that's proper specification, 
2 mean 0 and uh, x3 homoscedasticity. So this is assumptions 1, 2, and 3. Uh, go back over here. A1, A2, and A3 are invoked, and that's what's needed to sustain Gauss-Markov. So there's one more thing I want to show you, and that's how to get the VCV matrix estimate out of R in a matrix sense. Uh, so here I've got, um, I've got this example all uh, ginned up for you. And what I'm doing here is uh, creating a data matrix um, of 100 random variables distributed uniformly between 0 and 10, two columns, so I'm going to have two, uh, two variables, and that means I actually have two variables each of length 50. So this is actually a data set of size 50. And I'm going to uh, column bind um, 1 with x. So now I'm going to have three variables, the constant and then the two x values. I'm going to draw a beta matrix that I just made up. I'm going to call it 2.8, 1.3, and 6.5. So this is going to be the constant uh, beta. This is going to be the beta for x1, and this is going to be the beta for x2. And then I'm going to say that x, I'm sorry, y, is x beta plus a normally distributed random variable with mean 0 and standard deviation 2. So if I just run this stuff, uh, let me just give you a sense of what this looks like. Here's what the final x matrix looks like. It's three variables, a constant x1 and x2. There's the y, it's a vector, um, and by 1. Uh, now what I want to do is run a regression on this data, and I'm going to run it um, in longhand with matrices. So uh, here's where I'm running that regression. Uh, and you can see I'm calculating beta hat using x transpose x inverse x transpose y, longhand, just like we do in our lectures. So I'm going to run that and get estimates for beta. Whoops. And if I type in beta hat, Whoops. There you go. My estimates for beta are 2.5, 1.4, and 6.4, uh, which are pretty close to 2.8, 1.3, and 6.5, which is what we expected. Now what I'm going to do is get the VCV matrix. So in order to get the VCV matrix, the first thing I'm going to do is calculate u hat. u hat is y minus x beta hat. So there it is. This is the residuals. There's my residuals right there. This is the gap between y and x. And in fact, I could plot this if I wanted to say, um, uh, let's let's actually do a quick plot. So I'm, first, I'm going to predict y hat and whoops, y dot hat, uh, and y hat is going to be equal to um, x times beta hat. Oh, maybe I should put in the right symbol there. Put in uh, times. There we go. Uh, and now if I do a plot of y against y hat, u hat is just the distance from the y equals x line. So ab line h or mm, Ab line C01, LTY equals 1. There we go. The U hat is just the vertical gap from Y hat to Y for each one of these points. That's the, that's the collection of residuals. So that's what we're getting with U. Now the VCV matrix is, as we just uh, laid out, u transpose u times 1 over n minus k times x transpose x inverse. So that is this. There's u transpose u, and then there's the vcv. So if I run that, and then type in vcv, bam, whoops, should be lowercase, vcv, I got it. Now, how do I know that I did the right thing? How do I know I got the right vcv matrix? Well, there are a couple of ways I, I could figure that out. One way I could figure that out is to run a linear model of y against x. I think this will work. Let's see if this works. Sure it does. So if I do a summary of lm y equals x, first of all, I get the same coefficients I got. So b hat. Oh, it's including an intercept in there. So let me take out that intercept because I've already got an intercept in x. There we go. So now if I compare that to beta hat, they're the same. 
that's reassuring. I did the right thing. Now I want to see if my uh, variance covariance matrix is the same. Uh, there are a couple of ways I can do that. You can see, for example, that the standard error is reported right here. And if I got my VCV matrix right, these standard errors should be the square roots of the diagonal elements of my VCV. How do you get the diagonal elements of your VCV? Well, you go trace. Uh, no, wait a minute. Trace. I think it's going to add them. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, let's let's see. How do I get the diag? Oh, I know I can get the diagonal elements. Uh, I can say diag three times VCB. Mm, no, that didn't work either. <laughs> All right. Uh, how am I going to get the? Oh, how do I extract the diagonal elements? Mm, let's think about this. Uh, okay, I, I think I can do this. I can just say, give me the diagonal of the VCV. I think that will work. So let's try that. Ah, got it. So there's the diagonal elements of the VCV matrix I just got there. And now if I take the square root of that, square root, run it, I should get the same standard error. So 6.677, 0 0.677. 0 0.106, 0 0.106, 0 0.871. So now I'm pretty confident that I'm right. And if I really want to go nuts, I can go further. I can say, all right, well, let's look at the VCV versus V cove of LM Y given X. Is that a cap X? Yeah, minus one. V cove extracts the variance covariance matrix out of a linear model object. And you can see that the VCO for the canned linear model routine is extracting the exact same VCV as we calculated manually. So now we can be pretty sure we're right. All right, so I'm going to cut it off there, uh, and I will see you next week. Hope to see you then.